But unless you've been on an entirely different planet for some time, you could not have missed the entire hype, the entire excitement, the almost euphoria around artificial intelligence. Everyone's talking about it. It's a big buzzword. It's going to change people. It's going to change the world. It's going to change industry. And everyone should start thinking about what to do about it, and government policy in particular. That's why it's such a pleasure to have with us one of the leading thinkers in the field of artificial intelligence, Professor Andrew Ng. It's great to have you with us. It's a pleasure. He's an adjunct professor at Stanford. He talks about it. He lectures about it. He's also the, the co-founder of Coursera. So he's, he's teaching uh, people about it. It's absolute pleasure to be talking to you, and welcome to India. It's great to have you here with us. Thank you. I'm thrilled to be here. And um, I might as well start off with a personal confession, if that's OK with you. I am actually doing your course wow. uh, at, uh, of artificial intelligence. Very flattered that you would be you know, taking the class. No, it's a great class, and I'm learning a lot from it. But that's where the confession comes in, because uh, I'm actually supposed to be submitting a homework assignment to you in about one and a half hours time or one hour's time. And I'm sure you never heard this excuse before. I'm sorry, I, I'm not going to be able to submit this assignment on time because I'm interviewing you on television. That's a great one. I've never heard that one before. But I'm still very flattered that you're taking a class. So no, it's you. a great class. It's a great class. And I do promise I will submit the assignment uh, once, we, once we finish with this. Maybe I should ask you to give me some inside tips on stochastic gradient descent so I could actually answer that question. Uh, you really easy. know your stuff. Wow. Well, I'm learning. I'm learning thanks to you. All right. But President, if I could just, if I could just actually come to the, uh, you know, to the entire excitement around artificial intelligence that we are seeing right now. now. You've been working at it from a time when it was barely an idea. It was science fiction. Now it's reality. Uh, is the hype justified or is it being overdone? I think AI is transforming multiple industries, and this gives fantastic new opportunities to companies, to individuals, um, and to governments, to countries. So I think that a lot of the hype is justified because we are out to transform every major industry. Um, there's a little bit of hype about evil AI, killer robots, sentient overlord AI. I think that is overdone. I think from a communication standpoint, one of the challenges has to explain how AI is transforming every industry. We see a clear path to that, but we don't see a clear path to you know, building evil AI robot overlords. I've been saying AI is the new electricity, just like electricity about 100 years ago transformed every major industry. Um, AI will now do the same. So I'm going to ask you about both aspects about it. I mean, the fact that AI could come in and wipe out mankind, which there are people who say that. Now, it's not necessarily it'll be designed to do that. It could happen by accident. I'll, I'll ask you about that in a couple of minutes. But the electricity part of it, uh, you know, People are still trying to figure out how we, and companies are trying to figure it out, how is that actually going to happen? And is that, because electricity, you're right, to transform everything. Is it electricity? Is it like the internet? And how could it, for example, transform our day to day lives? Um, I think that. So I hope to live in a world where all of us uh, can get to work or get around in self-driving cars, where the healthcare system is lower cost, high quality, where every five-year-old child has access to a fantastic and low cost um, education. So I think that um, all of these industries will be transformed by AI, but there's a ton of work to do. And you know, no one company, right? I can't do that work. No one company do all that work. That's why one of my passions has been trying to teach these tools to as many people as possible so that People all around the world, people all around India, all around the world can do the important work to be done to build this AI-powered society. You know, but there has been excitement about artificial intelligence several times in the past. And quite often, that has flattered to deceive. You know, AI is going to come and it's going to change everything. And then it, it didn't quite work. The, tec the techniques weren't quite correct. People went down a different path. Why is this time going to be different? Is it because of computing power? A lot of technologies, I think AI is in this phase, uh, go through a winter, 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 and eternal spring. So AI has had a, a few winters, and I think we are now in the eternal spring part. And the reason I say that is because um, when I look at the concrete use cases, I see companies being transformed using AI. So the great AI companies like Google and Baidu and many others that have embraced AI and it's completely transformed the way that you get web search, or the way that maps work, and the way that other digital services work. And um, I've been spending a lot of time in manufacturing plants, uh, landing.ai. And we see that whenever I go into a manufacturing plant, pretty much always there are lots of ways to improve manufacturing using AI. Um, the healthcare system, 
um, you know, we do a bunch of work. I think that um, uh, radiologists' jobs will be transformed. And for countries like India, where there's a shortage of healthcare workers, of doctors, I think AI is probably the best way to scale up, to develop a low cost and high quality uh, healthcare system. And this is a global problem, not just an Indian problem. So there are many, you know, my friends and I sometimes challenge each other to name an industry that will not be transformed by AI. And uh, I, I actually have a hard time coming with one. My best example was the hairdressing industry because you know my, 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 my hairdresser cuts my hair, there's no data, I, I don't know how to build a robot to automate that. Um, although I once said this on stage and one of my friends who's a robotics professor was in, was in the audience and later she stood up, pointed at my head and she said, Andrew, most people hairstyle, couldn't build a robot to do that, but your hairstyle, Andrew, I could get a robot to do that. So wow. I, 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 I don't know, but, but I actually find it difficult to think of an industry that won't be transformed by AI. Yeah, I used to think TV anchors, maybe not the place, but we've got Sophia actually co-anchoring a show with us you know, this week, so you know, there, we, there we are. Um, but, you know, I'm again coming back to your saying eternal spring this time. So one is the techniques seem to be changing. So deep learning has now got a certain way. You're, you're being able to figure out how to use neural networks in an effective manner. So is that part of it? And is it just that computers, the speed of computer chips is improving so much, you've got GPUs and TPUs and all of that. Is that what's enabling a, a spring this time? Yeah, the rise of data and the rise of uh, compute has powered the recent rise of deep learning. Um, and then algorithmic innovation, new, new inventions be, are also continuing to accelerate that. To cut through a lot of the hype, it turns out that AI is you know, helping companies make sick of amounts of money and uh, bring much better products to consumers. But it turns out that with the recent rise of AI, almost all the economic value is created through one type of AI, uh, which you have seen in the Coursera course, which is supervised learning. And that means learning input to output or A to B mappings, like input a um, English sentence and output a translation into Hindi or Tamil, some other language, or uh, input an ad and some information about you and output, will you click on this ad? That turns out to be very lucrative for the large online advertising platforms uh, because showing more relevant ads has a direct impact on their bottom line. Or um, input a uh, picture of what's in front of your car and made the radar readings and output the position of other cars. This is a key component for self-driving cars. Or uh, in manufacturing, input a picture of a part that the company has just manufactured, maybe a, maybe a phone or a laptop or some other device is manufactured, input a picture of that and output is, it, is this defective, is there a scratch on this? That's visual inspection. That will really help manufacturing companies. So um, despite all the hype about AI, it turns out that this idea of input to output, A to B mappings called supervised learning, this technology by itself will transform every industry. Or input an X-ray uh, output, you know, is what is the diagnosis for this X-ray. So a lot of the work to come in the next several years is just figuring how to take A to B supervised learning and put them into different industries and it will be very valuable. Of course, the AI community is still busy inventing new technologies, and as new ways of technology come online, I think there'll be opportunities for new wave of value creation. Right. Um, uh, well. uh, so, and a lot of what you've spoken about is what is sometimes called artificial narrow intelligence. It's teaching, you know, the, the AI system does one particular task and then gets to do it really well. Google Maps being a great example of that. Google Maps probably can navigate its way around Delhi much better than I can, and I've spent my entire life in Delhi, so you know, there you have it. Uh, it it's a real, and to navigate in Delhi is not the easiest thing to do, but it does it better than any human can. Um, these are not generalized learning systems though, so to that extent, intelligence is nowhere close to human level intelligence. Do you think we'll ever get to human level intelligence, and should we try to get to human level general learning? I think uh, I would love to get to uh, human level AI some point. I don't know how long it will take, maybe 100 years, maybe 500, maybe 1,000 years. Really hard to predict. One of the problems with the hype in AI is that, as you say, almost all the progress has been on artificial narrow intelligence, or building specialized intelligences, um, rather than artificial general intelligence, which is this uh, great mission of building human level AI that could do anything that you and I can do. We should totally work on that. But one of the problems is that both of these things, narrow and general intelligences, uh, they're both called AI. And so when we see all the progress in narrow intelligences, like self-driving cars, I mean, that's really cool, um, it's led some people to think there's a lot of progress in artificial general intelligence as well, yeah. whereas almost all the progress, which is incredibly valuable, has been on building these more specialized or narrow intelligences. The benefits of what AI could do are, are clear and obvious. It could have a major impact on healthcare. It could 
end pollution by figuring out ways of doing you know energy better all sorts of things could have, could start to happen um, but jobs is going to be a problem with more automation you will lose jobs and how do countries deal with that how do societies deal with that yeah in fact what we're seeing in a lot of countries uh, including india is a skills mismatch where sometimes there are people being laid off in one company but that same company has job openings that it cannot fill um, and so I think that the challenge is less of one of running out of meaningful and important jobs for humans to do is that a lot of people do not currently have the right skill set. You know, I'm seeing that the nimble, the smart CEOs and the smart CLOs, our chief learning officers, are now empo approaching employee development very different than they were a decade ago. Uh, for example, one of the things we've learned is that with the rise of the internet, any company can have access to fantastic content, or in fact, more generally, fantastic core competence of a different company sometimes at a relatively low cost. So one, the smart CLOs today are learning that you shouldn't create content, you should curate content. Right? Yeah. Just, just, like, just like I think uh, just like your startup, uh, uh, curating news to deliver a better experience is a very valuable service. Um, and I find that the smart CLOs today, uh, you know, go to Coursera or Khan Academy or lynda.com or whatever, there's so much good content today that COOs should bring that into enterprises and use that as a very low cost and high quality way to transform workforces.